Hello, welcome to Scott's Odyssey. We often think of Thanksgiving Day as a celebration that took place in the early years of the colonies, shortly after the New World was being settled, where a group of religious migrants running away from the tyranny of England made landfall at a place they called Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, and they suffered with the difficulty of the cold, harsh winter only to be helped by the natives who gave them food and seed and taught them how to farm. And that fall, the pilgrims celebrated with turkey and venison, fish, pumpkin squash, corn, sweet potatoes, and cranberries. The pilgrims were so grateful for the help from the Indians that they invited them to the celebration and joined in a mutual thanksgiving. They held hands and they sang Kumbaya. Unfortunately, little to none of that story can be further from the truth of the happenings that took place at that time. And in this video, I will share with you the story of Thanksgiving Day. See you in a minute. Before we go any further, I want to let you know, we've changed locations um, because there was a dastardly amount of noise pollution going on and I needed to find a place that was a little bit quieter so that this sensitive microphone doesn't get blasted with cars and things like that. So let's continue. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. I hope you enjoy this story of the real Thanksgiving day. Lower New England was a land with a few dozen confederations of Native American tribes, including the Massachusetts Confederation, who called their location the Dawn Land. This confederation as a whole was called the Ninamissinook, an Algonquin word meaning people of the first light. Each confederation had a leader called a Sachin, and they had been trading with Europeans for over a hundred years previous to the arrival of the Puritan pilgrims. All was good until the late 1500s and early 1600s when some Europeans began kidnapping natives and selling them as slaves throughout Europe and the West Indies. At this time, there was also a lot of groups trying to escape different parts of Europe because of the religious persecution that was building up to the Thirty Years' War, which would kick off on May 23rd of 1618. Unfortunately, when these immigrants would reach the shores of America, they were getting quickly turned away by appropriately angry Indians who already had populated the area along the coast and didn't take kindly to the kidnapping. Now, this is where it gets interesting. After some time, some Europeans were able to reestablish trade with the natives, and although not intentional, and even after a hundred years of contact, something different historically happened between 1616 and 1619. A disease was transferred from the Europeans to the Native Americans, a disease that quickly eliminated 90% of all Native Americans in the Ninamissinook in less than three years. This time period is known as the Great Dying. The Wampanoag, a confederation whose border was just below the Massachusetts and also where the pilgrims would ultimately make landfall, was in confrontation with the Narragansett. The differing opinion between the Wampanoag and the Narragansett was regarding what they as a people should do about the Europeans. The Wampanoag believed in live and let live, and the Narragansett believed that the Europeans should be decimated for their crimes against natives. Unfortunately for the Wampanoag, they would not get a final say in this disagreement because, well, they all died of disease during the Great Dying. Back in Europe in 1605, a group of Calvinist Puritans at the time called the Brownist or Separatist or the Lord's Free People were a religious order that was in opposition to ritualistic practices in the newer formed King James I Church of England. And they preferred Sabbatarianism as well as anything opposing Episcopal polity. They left England due to direct religious persecution from King James and established a colony 
in Holland. Sabbatarianism is a Christian belief that Sunday and only Sunday is the Sabbath, which is a day of religious observance and abstinence from work and only observed on that day. And Episcopal polity, it's a description of a hierarchical government structure established within the church, making both religious doctrine as well as decisions regarding civil culture and affairs of the state. Because they began to lose their language, culture, and religious foundations while in a foreign country, the separatists decided they needed a new colony and set their eyes on moving to the new world. They essentially begged King James for a patent to establish a colony and made an agreement they would pay off all their debts with the fish and goods collected in the new world. King James offhandedly agreed and the pilgrims set their eyes on the Hudson Bay area. On September 6th of 1620, a trip that would normally have taken about 40 to 45 days, the Mayflower left the port of Plymouth and took off on a voyage from England to New York that lasted 66 days, a lot longer than what was anticipated with poor provisions and poor still leadership and direction. You see, these were not farmers or fishermen. They were investing merchants and devout religious separatists who did not intend to go and start a new life in the new world, but rather go to the new world, practice their own religion, and through this practice, purify the established Church of England with the hopes of returning with an improved version of the religion that all people, even, king, even the king, could agree upon. You caught that, right? They did not intend to stay here, and they were not ready for what they found here. So here we are in the first weeks of November with the temperature averaging between 38 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, a whopping 10 to 20 degrees colder than what they had been used to, with little to no food and nothing more than the clothes on their back. Landing days overdue in some nondescript remote wilderness location on the shores of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, after they got stuck in a really bad storm, nearly 400 nautical miles from their destination of the Hudson Bay area in New York. Yeah, that's what really happened. Now, the pilgrims knew they would not be able to survive in the new world without some basic provisions and the ability to have basic building tools to create a colony. But the Mayflower was not properly equipped with such provisions or tools, nor was there anything historical saying that the pilgrims had properly planned for this issue. I mean, even if they had gotten to New York, there was no colony there for another six years, and the colony that did form there six years later wasn't even English, but it was Dutch. Regardless, food and resources were scarce, and although the pilgrims had sought to become fishermen, well, they didn't know how to fish. So the pilgrims resorted to robbing Native American graves, Native American homes, and Native American buried storage locations for food. As is recorded by the first week of December, they were engaged by a group of extremely angry Indians. No one is recorded as hurt or killed in this incident, but the pilgrims immediately packed up their ship, left Cape Cod, and moved across the Cape Cod Bay to a location they called New Plymouth, a name given based on their original port of call, Port Plymouth in England. The 102 pilgrims found themselves without food, without tools, and the inability to build more than four small cabins in order to house themselves before the first of the winter storms hit, just days after their arrival. From December to March, 44 of them died to weather, lack of shelter, scurvy, and the inability to live on the ship. And at the end of March, a sachem from the Abenaki tribe named Samoset arrived at their colony and informed the pilgrims they were building on a dead tribe of Patuxet, and were being watched by the chief and owner of the land, Massasoit of the Wampanoag. The pilgrims responded by stating they were eager to make trade with the natives. Several days later, Sam Musset came back with items to trade and with a native translator named Tisquantim, a native more commonly known as Squanto, who informed the pilgrims that Massasoit had arrived. Needless to say, Sachem Massasoit did not trust any of these newcomers. Pilgrim Edward Winslow was given to the Wampanoag as a hostage, and he declared the good and peaceful intentions of the pilgrims to the Sachem Massasoit, 
and the Sachamassasoit accepted the terms and entered New Plymouth, honored by Governor John Garver and given all the respect of a regal king. A coexistence and protection treaty was created between the Wampanoag and the Pilgrims. It ensured that each would protect the other from their own kind should something happen. This meant that the Pilgrims would protect the Indians from the French and Spanish, and the Wampanoag would protect the newcomers from the Mohegans, Narragansetts, and Massachusetts. Squanto brought others with him and taught the Pilgrims basic farming skills for the land, which quickly and advantageously benefited the new colony. <laughs> it was all going as planned by Squanto. Oh, I forgot to mention, Squanto was originally born as a Patuxet Indian, where the Pilgrims were currently living on his dead family and had recently stolen from their graves. Yeah, Squanto was captured seven years earlier and taken to Spain to be sold as a slave. He was resold after a year in Spain to a merchant in London, where he learned how to speak English very well. He told the merchant his story and was ultimately permitted to work for his own release and returned to his home of Patuxet which finally came to pass in 1619. Squanto returned to find the Patuxet was no more and his tribe was all dead. Sachin Massasoit permitted Squanto to stay only because he needed someone who could speak and interpret English. Because Squanto was spending so much time with the new colonists, Massasoit sent his number one warrior brave, Hobomo, to watch over everything that Squanto was doing. Back to New Plymouth. It was now October 1621 and the harvest was an incredible bumper crop, especially compared to what the pilgrims had gone through just a year earlier. Massasoit was invited to come to an end of harvest feast as a sign of the pilgrims acknowledging the native tradition of feasting at the end of a harvest, as is and was common historically amongst all formative cultures. Sachin Massasoit arrived with 90 warriors and five deer to contribute to the feast. This end of harvest feast lasted for three full days, and it is recorded as a very great day, and is probably the story that gave us what is taught to us in school as the first Thanksgiving. But that's not the whole story. You see, Thanksgiving was not a day of eating a ton of food at the end of a harvest season. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite. In the Puritan religion, Thanksgiving is a day of fasting and prayer of thanks for that which you actually have received by the grace of God to live on one more year. And what about Squanto? Why is he so important and why didn't the Sachin Massasoit trust him? Well, you see, Squanto had learned a thing or two about how Europeans work, and he himself wanted the power of Sachem. After all, he did originally claim to be the Sachem to the pilgrims when they first met and referred to Massasoit as a chief and not the Sachem. During the past year, and based on his original introduction of Massasoit to the pilgrims, he had his local tribesmen believing that he and he alone could command the pilgrims to make peace or war at his own will. Now, believe it or not, the warrior brave Hobomo was onto something being off at Squanto and had warned the new governor, William Bradford, on several occasions, don't trust him. The combination of the warning from Hobomo and further digging by Governor Bradford led to the spoiling of Squanto's plot, and the information was relayed to Sachin Massasoit. Now, Sachin Massasoit was so angered that he demanded the turning over of Squanto in order for him to be executed. But Governor Bradford, being a good Christian, refused to turn over a perfectly good translator to the hands of a savage for execution. Unfortunately, the whole treaty clearly stated that Massasoit had all jurisdiction over all Indians, just as Governor Bradford had all jurisdiction over all newcomers. But just before Squanto was released to the Wampanoag, a ship was seen just off the coast that caused a lot of worry and confusion for both of the parties. Angered by the interruption, the Wampanoag left without Squanto. The ship that was seen is a new group of 60 well-to-do English citizens heading to Boston in order to establish a new colony. To say the least, these new colonists were not exactly good or friendly to the Massachusetts or the Wampanoag Indians up in that area, to the point at which the natives spoke of waging a war and killing those colonists off. 
Squanto warned the New Plymouth Pilgrims of this plot, which spurred the New Plymouth Pilgrims to go up to the colony near Boston and preemptively attack and kill the local natives in order to save the new colonists. This brought about an uneasy peace between the colonists and the natives while creating a much greater distance between both cultures and peoples. The Pilgrims of New Plymouth did okay for about a decade, but their numbers began to drop and their skill sets with farming began to fail. In 1630, the colonists in New Plymouth found themselves in a similarly poor situation just as they had when they first arrived. Long forgotten was the day of the great harvest and the peace with the local natives. Further strengthening of the Puritan piousness and reformative ways decidedly ended relations with all of the Indians as non-sustainable. Because of this, the Puritans were becoming their own worst enemy and needed to send requests back to Europe in order to obtain provisions for the coming months. The downside was that in Europe, the Thirty Years' War was in full swing and nobody cared about the starving Puritans because they were, well, Puritans. Captain William Pierce, the mariner and the third captain of the Mayflower, was charged with procuring provisions for the colony. His anticipated arrival was on October of 1630, but was to no avail. By the middle of December, it was believed that perhaps they were betrayed by Pierce, or the king found out about their plans, or maybe even pirates had captured him. The pilgrims continued to live on the coast, feeding only on clams, mussels, ground nuts, and acorns that they could forage in the woods. And then the weather turned really bad. Upon looking deeper into what little stores they had, a decision to conserve more food through religious fasting was to be observed on February the 6th, a redesignation of the religious Thanksgiving Day. The hopes were that God would see them through these hard times. Now, by the grace of God, or more likely the luck of the Irish, on February 5th, a ship out of Dublin, Ireland named the Lion made landfall at Nantesket, just 30 miles north of the colony. This ship was brought by Master William Pierce. As it would turn out, the delay of his arrival was due to the fact that nobody wanted to help the Puritans. And William Pierce had extreme difficulty in procuring any resources to help them out of their situation. Fortunately, the Irish came through, giving them a ship and a grand abundance of provisions. Because of this divine intervention, the Thanksgiving Day, or Day of Fasting, was moved to February 22nd, and the Puritans partied. By this time, the Puritan religion had reached a point where the natives were considered wild, savage, evil, and unredeemable creatures. And by 1640, the Puritan religion was so far reaching, and so many more settlers had come running to the New World to evade religious persecution, that they now outnumbered the natives. This led to the idea of trying to convert the Indians to Puritanism, which ultimately failed. The peace treaty was honored until 1660, when Sachem Massasoit died. Massasoit's second son, Sachem Metacomet, or his English name Philip, had difficulty keeping the treaty in place because he personally disagreed with it and was known on occasion for killing any Indian that converted to Christianity. The most notable of these incidents was that of Christian Indian John Sassamon, who warned the Plymouth colonist of Metacomet's plans for a rebellion, was ignored, and shortly thereafter was found dead in an icy pond. This incident led to the colonists leading a trial and conviction of three Wampanoag men who were promptly hanged to death in response to this direct violation of the established treaty by his father. In 1675, such a Metacomet, often referred to by the colonists now as King Philip, declared an all-out war against the existing colonists and the stopping of all future colonists coming to and stealing their lands. This war was called King Philip's War, and it was the first true war between colonists and Indians, and both sides suffered tragic losses. This war was so great that neutral colonies such as Rhode Island and all surrounding native confederations within the Ninimissinook were involved. Oddly enough, a few confederations allied themselves with the Puritan colonists, such as the Mohegans, and even more oddly, the Pequot, who were formally decimated by a joint Mohegan and Puritan massacre in 1637 called the Mystic Massacre, which consequently was also declared by John Underhill as a day of thanksgiving. 
Cowan has lost more than 30% of their population and the natives about 50%. The war ended 14 months later with the shooting and killing of King Philip, who was then hung, beheaded, drawn and quartered. His head was put on a spike and then it was displayed at the Plymouth Colony Town Center for the next 20 years. Now that you know the actual story behind the story of the great day where natives and colonists shared their autumn harvest, I'll tell you where the actual and truly historical day of Thanksgiving comes from. The first formal declaration of Thanksgiving was in 1775 where Massachusetts formally asked if all the colonies would stop the rumors of separation and celebrate on November 18th in an attempt to unify the colonies with the British. Yeah. That got zero traction was seen as the obvious propaganda being spewed from the king in an attempt to muddy the waters of the colonial separatists. The second happened due to a specific battle in the Revolutionary War. The Revolution of the United States was in full swing by 1777 and the colonists had just gotten their butts handed to them in the Battle of the Clouds and the pivotal battle known as the Battle of Brandywine. In the Battle of Brandywine, the Continental Army had lost Philadelphia which is where the Continental Congress had been meeting more or less regularly due to the fact that Philadelphia was the capital. So because they could not stop meeting to discuss plans and actions for the rest of the revolution, they did it in the next best safe location, which is here in York, Pennsylvania, at the old York Courthouse, now called the Colonial Complex. Although you should know that this is not actually the real courthouse, but a recreated courthouse in a colonial style about two blocks away from the original location that was torn down in the 1840s or 1850s and could be found smack in the middle of the new town square. Anyway, at this point, the revolution, things looked grim for the colonists. If we did not secure a few key points very soon, the colonies would be lost. The Battle of Saratoga came in two fights, 18 days apart the Battle of Freeman's Farm and the Battle of Bemis Heights, which I might add if it was not for the infamous Benedict Arnold, you know, the guy who betrayed his country and is conveyed as a traitor. Well, what you might not know is that Major General Benedict Arnold was a true patriot of the colonies and was the only reason why the Battle of Bemis Heights was won. It was Arnold's decisive choices as well as defiance of General Gates's orders that made the difference. General Gates was a good general who was also trying to overthrow Washington and would have succeeded if it were not for Lafayette and his infamous toast. In the Revolutionary War, the winning of the Battle of Saratoga was the turning point that ultimately led to our victory and our independence. The Battle of Saratoga was won on October 17, 1781, and word of the victory reached the Second Continental Congress in York, Pennsylvania on October 31st. The next day on November 1st, 1777, and because of this major victory, Samuel Adams and Richard Henry Lee pushed for a national day of Thanksgiving. The following morning on November 2nd, the Continental Congress declared December the 18th as the very first official national day of Thanksgiving. The purpose of this day was to establish a day of reflection and thanks thankfulness for everything that has led up to the birth and prosperity of this newly formed and independent country. A day, and I quote, that with one heart and one voice, the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts. And that's it. That's what we celebrate as Thanksgiving. That is the core, that is the value and the purpose of what we call Thanksgiving. Now, the Revolutionary War raged on to our avail and ended on September 3rd, 1783. Unfortunately, over the course of those six years, there was a lot more blood and a lot more loss. One of those losses was that day of Thanksgiving. In a final effort during this time of peace and beginning of prosperity, the now President George Washington received many requests and made a proclamation establishing Thursday, November 26th, of 1789 as a national Thanksgiving Day. Interestingly enough, Thanksgiving Day still was not an annual holiday. Many people had days dedicated in their area and town to the celebration of the end of harvest or some sort of autumnal get together, but there was still not an agreed upon regular celebration of any day to give thanks. Fast forward to 1815. 
After the War of 1812, President James Madison proclaimed a day in 1815 to celebrate as a Thanksgiving Day. Unfortunately, Madison received some scornful rhetoric from Thomas Jefferson regarding these days of Thanksgiving. Rightfully so. Jefferson stepped into conversation saying that this proclamation of a day of Thanksgiving is covered in overtones of religious doctrine and beliefs, which could cause a divide between the people. And ultimately, he saw these days of declarations not appropriate for a nation that was founded on the separation of church and state. And with that, all things regarding Thanksgiving went quiet for a long while. Fast forward to 1846. In 1846, a woman by the name of Sarah Josephina Buell Hale, a teacher, a writer, a poet, the one who penned Mary Had a Little Lamb, decided it was time to have a national, common, annual Thanksgiving Day. Hale spent 17 years of pushing ink, writing letters to political leaders, getting published in magazines and newspapers, perpetually writing about this day of Thanksgiving. When the Civil War broke out, Jefferson Davis issued a Thanksgiving Day proclamation in late 1861 and early 1862 after several Southern victories. Abraham Lincoln followed suit and declared a day of thanks in April of 1862 following the Union victories of uh, Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, Shiloh, and again in 1863 after the Battle of Gettysburg. Hale decided to take this day of Thanksgiving discussion directly to the top, wrote to President Lincoln and Secretary of State William Seward, it is not known if the holiday was already being considered to be perpetual or national before Hale's request, but what we do know is Hale's request is what put the final nail in a coffin for this day. Seward modified Lincoln's 1863 proclamation to perpetuate the last Thursday in November as an official national holiday called Thanksgiving. Lincoln believed that this day would mark a day where we would give thanks to all that we have been granted, even with all of our faults, from some benevolent supreme being that makes sure our country continues to survive and thrive, even in the darkness, and that this proclamation would help us heal from our wounds inflicted both foreign and domestic. So there you have it, Thanksgiving Day. It's a day for all of us to reflect on all that we have and all that we have received in manners and ways that are so good to us and good for us that foreign nations and those of ill will actively seek to destroy it and rip it away from us. A never ending series of attacks, yet through it all, something bigger than you or me or all of us helps keep us strong and bountiful. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving day and try to remember that we're all struggling with proponents of ill will trying to take away all that goodness that each of us have received. I also hope you enjoyed learning about Thanksgiving Day. I did. And I'll see you on the next video.